Cooling towers are an essential part of every chiller system. When I say every chiller system, there are systems out there, and we're specifically honing in on water-cooled systems that they're using things like geothermal or they're using lake water, ocean water, ships. You know, ships have chillers in them. They're using ocean water to run their condensers. Um, and there's a lot of power plants that you they're, they're set up by a lake. It's intentional because they use that lake water to cool their cooling systems and their chillers. And a lot of them use uh, natural draft uh, cooling towers in order to accomplish that. Uh, most of what we use in the industry are, um, are, are well, we're considered forced draft or it's not really, there's two versions, forced and induced draft. We're using mechanical like cooling. We're not using natural draft. There we go. That's the, I guess the better way to say that. We're actually using a mechanical process to do what we're doing. So there's other ways of doing it other than having to have a cooling tower if we're going to use these natural things. Uh, geothermal systems are very much what they sound like. You know, we're using the ground loop or uh, or even a, if we're not using lake water directly, I know of systems where they've taken, they basically sink a, a, a heat exchanger down into the lake water uh, or into the body of water and they're flowing water through the heat exchanger that's down into the water submerged. So that's another way um, uh, I've, I've, I know that these can be done outside of just a regular cooling tower, but for most applications we're going to deal with, we're going to have some level of cooling towers. We're going to, we're going to have to process through these other more specialty designs have their own unique things. I'm not an expert in those types of designs. I'm familiar with them. I'm aware of them. Uh, they've got the like the lake water's got to go through a lot of filtering and, and has to go through some processing before it gets sent through the equipment. Otherwise, uh, you don't get a whole lot of runtime out of it before you've got to start doing servicing on it. So there's there's things that go into that process. We also have a lot of environmental issues to deal with when we start trying to use our uh, natural bodies of water to act as our cooling system. That's not the focus of this. Our focus here is we're going to hone in on just the standard towers that we would typically use um, and go through what they are. And what a tower is at the end of the day, it's a big water cooler, hydronic cooler. It's a hydronic condenser. Think of it like that. Because ultimately, the focus of the condenser in a regular system is just to reject the heat from the primary cooling system so that we can um, continue processing more heat. So while it's not literally condensing, if anything, a, a cooling tower is just the opposite. It, it evaporates water, <laughs> whereas a proper condenser is going to be condensing refrigerant back down into a liquid. The concept is what I'm trying to communicate there. So on a high level, your cooling tower is going to be connected to a water-cooled system. So if it's air-cooled, you're not going to have any of this involved. Air-cooled is going to have an air over coil. It's going to be processing air to the ambient and, you know, heat rejected. So in a water-cooled circumstance, though, we've, we've got to be able to cool our condenser down. And we use water. It's a hydronic condenser to do that. So... We have to pass that heat from the condenser somewhere. It doesn't just magically disappear because we flowed water over it. So we can process that through a cooling tower, and then it helps us reject the final phase of that heat. So the heat transfer process is very multi-stage. We have to first take it in at the evaporator. Then we get rid of it inside the condenser uh, to the water. So we take it from the water, put it in the refrigerant. Refrigerant takes it to the condenser. We put it from the refrigerant back into a different set of water and then that water flows out to a cooling tower and then that cooling tower is able to do the final rejection to atmosphere which is where we want it the whole point of cooling systems is to get the heat from somewhere we don't want it and put it somewhere where it doesn't matter in our case being just air so just from a high level i really want to simplify these and just think of them as a condenser that uses water, and there's a big hydronic condenser, and we call them cooling towers because, well, from a you know 
super specific, you know, critically engineered, whatever. They're not literal condensers. Okay. That's what I'm trying to say here. They're not literally condensers, but the concept of what we want them to do and the different ways that we can control what we have is very, very important because your ability to tune a plant and its operation and to get a chiller performing at its optimal will depend on your ability to also contribute to the control of the cooling tower. So as a chiller technician, I spent just as much time uh, trying to work with, an autom with a building uh, management team or whoever was there at the facility and whoever they were using for their automation system trying to help them better optimize their towers so that I could better optimize my chiller. And how they were choosing to run their towers was heavily impacting how I was able to run my chiller. And one of the resistance things that I've ran into, it does require some additional programming and controls. And you have to, like, you can create, it doesn't have to be an actual PID that's reactive in order to fluctuate set points and stuff and fans. It can be just simple, you know, um, and or thresholds that we cross and it just trigger an output based off of that threshold and we, we make adjustments and resets based off of that. At the end of the day though, that means that if they didn't already have that programming built in, well now you've got to convince them to spend money on the control system, which control people are not cheap whatsoever. Um, and so, and then that's if, a lot of them, a lot of them I've worked with, uh, they just, they just, if they don't have to program it, they won't. A lot of them I've worked with, and I'm not saying they're all like that. There are some really good uh, controls people out there that really care about system operation, optimization, and performance. But there's a lot of them that just, as, if the program works, they don't really, they're not, they don't care about efficiency. They don't care about it being truly optimized. They just want it to function from point A to point B. And that could be just a symptom of a lot of like controls technicians and companies are in just as high of a demand as service technicians and companies. So maybe it's just a symptom of they're just as overloaded. They're just as underpowered or undermanned and overwhelmed. And as long as it functions, it's good enough for them because they've got 10 more jobs to get to and they're behind schedule on all of them. That's a valid thing versus what we're coming in and we're trying to optimize this plant and this machine. And we're asking for things that in their mind, like it's not their biggest priority. It's not, it's not impacting their day to day very much. And so like I've had them argue many times that this is just, this is not necessary. Like, you know, just set a static set point that doesn't change, doesn't do anything, doesn't fluctuate with anything. And just let the system run and just see what it, it, it does what it does. You know, turn the fan on when it wants cool, turn it off when it's done. No real variable capacity. Like I've, I've had them argue this be, strictly because they, whether they either, whether it's distant, didn't want to, or did, didn't have the capacity to make that a priority at that time. Either way it is. Um, these are things that we'll run into. So you're likely to run into people who are very much the same way. And so un unless you are going to go through the process of learning how to write code yourself, being able to interface with these systems and do this yourself, which is a whole nother conversation of liabilities and other issues that your company probably isn't going to want to do. Um, yeah, it's just going to be extra challenging. And that's one of the things where uh, like the most recent company I was with, we actually did both in house and the automation and mechanical teams worked really closely together. So when I had a building that we were say taking over, we were trying to get optimized, get everything sorted out. And we had the automation contract was lots of the time we did. Then that was much easier of a process because then we're just working internally. And let's say I wanted to, to hook up and do some modifications to this program. Well, like we're already owning it as a company anyway. Um, 
versus if now you've got a third party involved and you touch their program uh, and they, like, even though it's the customer's program, they get to pick and choose who works on it. There are companies who uh, they'll literally walk out on a customer. If they find out that they let somebody else modify their, their programming without their knowledge or consent, they will pack their bags and they will go somewhere else. And that customer is just left dead in the water to figure it out. And they've got to find somebody else who can come in and completely take back over and get their head around whatever the heck is going on at the time. Like that stuff happens. So anyway, kind of getting off on a tangent here, but um, yeah, it's important to know how towers are functioning, how to optimize them so that we can then work with our customers to better optimize for our chiller. And there's lots of times where you'll show up for a chiller service call and it quickly turns into a cooling tower service call because like the chiller is just a symptom of a tower issue at that point. Happens all the freaking time, especially at high uh, ambience or high wet bulb conditions specifically, which is where towers perform their poorest. Uh, and depending on what kind of, you know, design conditions you have and for your plant, you know, your tower may not be able to get your, your water at a, at a good enough temperature to prevent your system from constantly dealing with surging and stuff that happens. Uh, or the tower just threw a belt and it couldn't get enough torque on the, on the fan to spin it fast enough or properly. And, uh, you just weren't moving enough air change the belts out and you're, you're on your way stuff like that right so there's companies out there that are truly fans to flange for chiller people uh chiller technicians which is bizarre to me uh but they literally you know if it did turn into a tower issue there's companies out there that, that well that chiller technician like he he's done and we're going to send somebody else versus just having that technician deal with it every company i've been with like you may have been the chiller technician on site but that tower became your problem, which I'm fine with. Like that's, I don't think there's a problem with that format, but I know, and I've talked to people who believe very firmly that no, I'm a flange to flange chiller tech. If it is a problem outside of my chiller's flanges, it is not my problem. I don't encourage you to be that way. Even if you have a company that that is their expectations, um, I think you're limiting yourself and you are minimizing your ability to tune that chiller. Because if you can take control of optimizing that tower and you know exactly how to optimize your chiller, because most people who don't know how to work on chillers don't know how to properly optimize a tower, in my experience, like now you you can you can really get something going here. You can really you can make a plant just hum and sing. Like that, that, that really where I had a lot of joy is when I can make adjustments, get everything tuned out, get the flows right, get the temps right, the set points, get the automation and all the PIDs tuned in where they're working together, not against each other. You get all that tuned in. Oh man, can a, can a plant just hum? It's beautiful. I love it. Anyway, cooling towers.